Look, it's well documented that Putin's Russia feeds its people propaganda rather than news about the war in Ukraine uh, and the reasons for that war and so on. But did the population have to be prepared in advance to be receptive to this? And if so, how? Absolutely. I mean, ever since Putin returned to the presidency for his third term in 2012, he's been increasingly spooked by the idea that a domestic revolt, a democratic revolt might come at home. And so he has spent the last 10 years turning towards an increasingly extreme nationalistic ideology. And at the forefront of that has been efforts to re-engineer the way that children are taught and the way that children engage with each other and engage with the state. And that means, above all else, militarism, learning to be soldiers, learning to engage with war, and learning, sadly, to love war as well. And so, I mean, moving to young people specifically, how are they being targeted? How is this done? Is it done through through state media? Is it done through digital and online propaganda? Is it done through sort of state involvement in popular culture? Talk us through it. I mean, the efforts are really totalizing. It's hard when you're outside of Russia and when you're not familiar with the way that Russia operates to understand the extent to which the state has its fingers in all of these pies. So that if you were young today, when you go to school, you will receive mandatory patriotism lessons about the military, about Russia's great heroic feats of the past. On television in the afternoon, you might watch a military war movie and the state is putting big money behind uh, producing new films aimed at young people, aimed at children in which the heroes of the past and indeed the present are turned into kind of military saints, military martyrs in which sacrificing yourself for the motherland is considered the greatest good and the greatest deed you can possibly complete, compete. Young people I met in Russia were aware, I think, of uh, state propaganda, but they were also quite cynical about it. They joke about it. Uh, I mean, was that unre unrepresentative? And do you think maybe it has it strengthened since then, do you think? I think what we're really seeing is, is a, a big stark divide emerging. And I think this is quite intentional on the part of the state. The state is forcing young people to choose between two identities. The identity that it favors in which to be a good citizen, to be a good community member means to be Russian, to be nationalistic, to be masculine, to be, of course, straight. Um, and to be on the outside is to be anything else, right? And as part of my research for the book, and I tell these stories in the book, I talk to young Russians who don't fit in, young Russians who are ethnic minorities, young Russians who are queer Russians, who find that they just can't recreate themselves in the way that the state wants. And the state is using this leverage to force, to create fissures in society, to amp up the population, to create the sense that there is always somebody on the outside threatening, and it is better to be on the inside, where even if you don't love it, it is at least safe and warm and you can belong to the collective. And to what extent is this sort of formalized into, into youth movements in a in a way that we'd well that we'd recognize certainly from sort of you know fascist movements of the past? So the state is recreating in some ways uh, the Soviet pioneers group. That was a youth group that was uh, almost every Russian child and Soviet child belonged to in the Soviet Union. But it's also bolting onto that sort of group, which was arguably fairly harmless as Soviet propaganda went. It's bolting on elements that are much more militaristic, much more aggressive in groups like the Youth Army. And the Youth Army was created in 2016 by the Defense Ministry, given a huge amount of funding. It now has 1.3 million members, and that membership has actually grown by 300,000 over the last year alone. And the Youth Army leaders I spoke to can't cope with the demand for people looking to sign up. And as part of that group, children are essentially taught to love the motherland. They are, quote unquote, spiritually prepared for war, and they are given a direct pipeline into the Russian military. And once again, we see that movement is bolted onto social media, influencing campaigns, games. It's made to look like something that is not quite your grandpa's 
fascist youth group, but something that's fun and something that's a little bit more flashy and appealing. Now, look, I'm sure, like, uh, I mean, <laughs> not that we'd be likely to have one on, but had we a Putin apologist on, uh, or indeed a, a Russian state spokesman, they would say this is this is like the Boy Scouts, this is like the the, the, the Scouts, the Venture Scouts, the, the Boys Brigade. Why is it different? So I think the difference is, of course, the destination. Mm. And the destination is clearly this fascistic message of constant war. The only way that we can survive as a country that is, from the perspective of the Putin apologist, is by destroying some sort of degenerating, deleterious force that's coming from the outside. And if you look over the last 20 years, even, of Putin's reign or rule in Russia, you can see that the attention has turned from Chechens, they're the ones we need to destroy, to homosexuals and queers about 10 years ago when the first anti-queer propaganda laws were brought in, to today Ukrainians. And the language is frighteningly reminiscent of the language of Nazism. And that is Ukrainians are diseased, they're de degenerate, they're animals. And in order for us to be healthy, in order for Russia to thrive, these people need to be destroyed. Would you say then that young people in Russia, and I'm, I'm talking about the kind of age group you're talking about, are likely to be more hardline in their anti-Ukraine, anti-Western views than their elders in that case? Because, I mean, the 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 the, uh, the assumption that a lot of us would make would be the opposite of that would be true, that the, the, the young would be more connected to the rest of the world. But are you saying, in fact, they are less so? It's extremely hard to know for now, because this is an ongoing indoctrinating project rather than a project that's been completely successful. And the message that I really want to drive home in the book is that right now we're not quite sure. We can see that this is a growing body within Rus Russian society. There are a growing and large amount, a significant amount of Russian children who are growing up in this environment, learning these behaviors. And it is at our peril that we simply say that because young people are young, they will inevitably move towards a liberal and Europeanizing vision of what Russia and what they might be in the future. And look, the the Ed that we the Ed the Z that we see on the tanks and a, and a, as a sort of a, a symbol of 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 what one, one might call sort of Putinist Russian fascism, does it have a particular cultural meaning that that strikes strong chords among the groups you're talking about? The Z is such a good example of the way that the Russian propaganda system has learned to operate, in particular under the Putin's PR guru, the so-called Grey Cardinal Vladislav Sorokov, over the last 20 years. In that this symbol is meaningless. It has no root in Russian culture. There is no reason that it should have been picked over anything else. And yet within weeks of the war starting, the state had turned this meaningless symbol into something that was just so laden with meaning that it is inescapably and inextricably connected to the idea of the war against Ukraine and connected to displays of nationalist pride. Mm. Now, look, before I let you go, what then does the future hold? I mean, because if if there is this, uh, this sort of swelling uh, youth fascism, fascism in Russia, that looks like a next generation that's going to be supportive of the kind of aims that Putin has now. Is there a, is that Can that hold be broken without either, either defeat in Ukraine or the death of Putin? Or is it, would it continue and survive even that? I, I, I think it can be broken. And the good news is that, well, firstly, there are still many young Russians who are absolutely rejecting this sort of material, who've spoken to me, who said, I just wish I had a voice. I wish I could find other people to connect with. And I wish I could find a way of calling myself Russian and being Russian without identifying with this sort of militarism and nationalist aggression. Now, if the state is successful in indoctrinating children online, its defenses online are also extremely weak. And we can be in those social media spaces creating opportunities for other young Russians to voice their opinions, to feel safe and to feel supported. And we can do that now without having to march into Moscow and occupy Moscow as we occupied Nazi Germany after 1945.